Well, good morning. Great to see you, and welcome to the last week of, of chapel. I can't believe we're at week 13, and the, um, the last moments of our time together. We have one more chapel coming up Thursday, but thank you for coming today in the middle of a just crazy, busy end of the semester. And as we begin today, I thought it would be appropriate just to focus our mind and heart for a minute on the, on the utter transcendence of God. A big word, transcendence, with a deep meaning. And it refers really to the degree to which God is separated from us and different from us. For example, Isaiah in chapter 40, verse 22, tells us that our God is the one who sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. Isaiah also in chapter 66 reminds us that heaven is his throne and that earth is his footstool and that all things were made by his hand. He is creator, God. Again, in Isaiah 58, the prophet reminds us that his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are higher than our ways. 
He is qualitatively different than us. He is creator and therefore independent of us. He doesn't need us, and yet he pursues us. That's an amazing thing. He is the prime mover of all things, the one who was, the one who is, and the one who is to come. The one who will reign forever, infinite, glorious, all-powerful, all-wise, all-knowing. This is the God who beckons you and me to come and worship. And would you stand as we do that today, beholding our God, the King of kings, and our Lord of lords. sing together, who has held the oceans in his hands?
Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning. Have you not been blessed this semester by the ministry of our Southwestern worship and church music team? Can you just give them a, a word of encouragement? It is a great privilege to welcome you to this, the last full week of this semester in 2021. A good welcome to the remnant who is here in person and also a good greeting to those of you who are streamlining right now live this service. And for others of you who are studying, God is full of mercy and grace. It is a great uh, privilege for me to introduce our speaker this morning who is a dear friend of mine personally. Dr. Rob Blackaby was born and raised in Vancouver, British Columbia. And if you're Googling that right now, it's one of the northwestern states, about one and a half times as big as Texas, so it is big. We're grateful for him. He did his undergraduate work at the University of British Columbia, and he earned both his MDiv and his PhD right here at Southwestern. Rob is husband to Joe Susan and father to three young adults, Rachel, John, and David. And here's what I love about this brother. He could have gone and served anywhere the fame of his name could have taken him. Henry is his uncle, but has chosen to serve in the difficult places in North America, places where no one is waking up looking for a good church. Rob has been senior pastor in Calgary, Alberta. He has been a church planting catalyst, and he continues to be active teaching both Christian ethics and spiritual leadership, and I love that, Rob, because I don't know any pastors who fail because of bad theology. Bless you for this ministry. In April of 2007, Rob became the third president of the Canadian Baptist Seminary and college that is nestled in the foothills of the Canadian Rockies. We are blessed by your presence, brother. Thank you so much for being here and preaching God's word for us today. As we continue in worship, I like to bend our hearts toward God's word, inspired of the spirit spoken by the Apostle John in his gospel, chapter one, says this, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life and that life was the light of men. Let's pray together. Father, we confess that this morning, many of us have come into this place with hearts and minds fully cluttered with stuff that is not from you. We bear with us anxiety over papers not yet written. We worry about information not yet memorized. We have brought with us philosophies that we have gained from social media and friends, but not from your word. So this morning, by your mercies, speak life into us as your servant preaches from your word make our hearts tender tender soil to receive the glorious gospel the truth that is a person do this so that as we leave this place even here on campus our colleagues our fellow students those who meet us in Fort Worth will know that we have been in the presence of the Almighty giver of life. Do this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. In this passage of scripture, John helps us answer one of the most significant questions we will ever be faced with in our life, and that is, who is this transcendent God of wonder? The answer to this question will define everything about us. In fact, it's one of the reasons why many of us come here to Texas Baptist College and 
Southwestern so that we might be fully equipped to answer this one question more completely, more fully, and more accurately. And more than that, to help others to know the same. Who is God, this King of glory? The appropriate answer to this question has ignited the hearts of worshipers for over two millennia. And today it ignites ours as well. So listen now and be reminded anew and afresh of the incomprehensibly glorious God we worship. Just for some minutes. 
and that he is glorious in wonders, fearful in praises. He is our God today, the one we worship, the God of wonder and the God who does wonders. Think about that for a minute. He is the God of wonder and the God who does wonders, utterly transcendent and yet graciously imminent, near. The one who loves and cares for his people. The one who teaches us to call him father and shepherd, the one who cares for his sheep. And as we head into this Advent season, Matthew reminds us of the imminent nearness of our creator God. We see this in Matthew chapter 1 as he writes, See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. Amen. He is near. We're never alone. And because of this, we have hope both in this life and in the life to come. God is with us now and forevermore. Amen. Would you stand? And let's declare our faith in Emmanuel, Christ. The Messiah, Christ, our hope in life and death. What is our hope in life?
Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning. I want to start by just acknowledging I'm not actually traveling alone. Um, I'm here as a group. And so I want to introduce Barry Nelson, who leads our school in the area of institutional advancement. You know, for the first time since early 2020, the borders have opened up between our countries. And although travel is cumbersome, it's possible. And so Barry and I have been in Texas for a few days, actually, visiting dear friends of our school. And so I want to acknowledge that Barry's here. Also here for ETS, Dr. Stephen Booth and Dr. Susan Booth, uh, who serve on our faculty. And so it's an honor to be here as part of a team representing our school. Um, it's tempting, I'm sure, every time an alumnus comes to speak in chapel, the temptation is to spend all the time walking down memory lane. As I'm walking through the campus, I'm experiencing a tidal wave of nostalgia. Uh, it's, it's been 1995 that my wife and I drove away from Fort Worth to head many hours north to Calgary, Alberta, uh, where we would pastor Trinity Baptist Church. Actually, that's where I got to know Dr. Bunton for the first time, and he's been a blessing in my life ever since. Um, this morning, I would like us to look at Luke chapter 19. Verses 1 to 10. I need to back into the passage, explain some of the backstory as to why this is an important passage for me right now. Um, and I hope by the end of this morning it'll be important for you. And the question I want to ask as we start with is, is maybe a rhetorical question. You know, have you ever been lost? Do like, you remember what that felt like as a child? I'm not, I'm, I'm not, maybe I should ask it differently. Have you, have, do you remember a time when you suddenly realized you were lost? Often as a kid, I became lost long before I knew I was lost. But then all of a sudden, whether it's a department store, as we used to call them, uh, or whether it's a mall, you suddenly recognize that um, nobody that I'm familiar with is within eyesight of me. Do you remember that feeling? When your heart starts to beat a little quicker, uh, you start looking a little more frantically. It transitions into a feeling of panic, desperation, fear. As a matter of fact, to me, the word lost is a terrifying word. I remember being there as a child. I remember being there as an adult, hiking, where you just can't remember or figure out your way out. A compass doesn't help you. I didn't have a GPS. It's where I don't know where I'm going, I don't know where I am, I'm disoriented, I, I have no direction, I don't know my way, I'm frightened, I'm terrified. And um, you know, Jesus uses the word lost, and in Jesus' mouth, this word lost is, is not a condemnation word, it's a compassion word. Recognizing that we're disoriented. It's profound, matter of fact, he uses it, before we get to our passage for today, he uses it in Luke chapter 15, Three different ways, doesn't he? I mean, we're talking about the first seven verses. He talks about the lost sheep. In the next verse, what, eight to 10, he talks about the lost coin. The remaining verses, he tells a story about a lost son. And now we get to Luke chapter 19, and we're talking about a lost tax collector. I, um, I, I was raised, I realize increasingly that this is, this is uh, more and more uncommon that I would have been raised in a family where mom and dad took us all to church from the time uh, before I could remember. In Canada, I would suggest to you in the United States, this is increasingly uncommon. I feel privileged that I actually grew up hearing this story. I was taught this story in Sunday school because it's a favorite Sunday school story. I was actually taught this story through a children's song, a catchy song about Zacchaeus. You remember? <laughs> Before I get into the passage, you know, here, here's the key for me is chapter 19, verse 10, on, it, coming from Jesus' mouth, he just simply confesses, I came to seek and to save those who are lost. During the early months of COVID-19, I'm sure your experience was exactly like our experiences 
in Calgary. I mean, in March of 2020, everything closed down. Everything transitioned to online. Everything was pivoting all around us and people were told to stay home and life just was really disrupted. Um, and I started reading through the Gospels just because I felt like this was a great place to get reoriented, understanding that this was not an accident, it didn't take God by surprise. Matter of fact, feeling more and more that this is a watershed moment in ministry in North America. This is an opportunity. Uh, normally we have opportunities that present themselves to us in the window of ministry. It opens up to us, but then it shuts fairly quickly. But during COVID-19, the windows have been gaping wide open month after month after month. This is a moment for us in Canada and I believe here as well. When I got to Luke chapter 19, I don't know about you, but if you've read a story in the Gospels, sometimes you don't mean to, but you kind of skim through it, like, you know, yes, I know that story. And when I got to this story, I was, I was caused to pause, and I don't know why I was caused to pause, I just did. And so I thought, I need to, I need to read through this again. I, what is it about this story that is important for where we're living right now in COVID-19? I mean, if, you're, if you have the songs, Zacchaeus was a wee little man running through your head, you might be asking the same question, exactly what does Zacchaeus? have to do with COVID-19. Well, let's read the story together. Jesus entered Jericho, starting with verse one. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. He was trying to see Jesus, but he was not able to because of the crowd, since he was a short man. So running ahead, he climbed up a sycamore tree to see Jesus since he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down because today I must stay at your house. So he quickly came down and he welcomed him joyfully. All who saw it began to complain. He's gone to lodge with a sinful man. But Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, I give half my possessions to the poor Lord, and if I've extorted anything from anybody, I'll pay back four times as much. Today salvation has come to this house, Jesus told him, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save the lost. Eugene Peterson interprets verse 10 this way. For the Son of Man came to find and restore the lost. I, I'm really struck by two things. Jesus seeks and Jesus saves. I could say it another way. Jesus sees and Jesus saves. Let's talk about this for a minute. Here's Zacchaeus. I'm, I'm going to tell you things you already know but it's important because of what's coming next. Zacchaeus was disoriented. Somewhere along the way, Zacchaeus went from being lost to actually comprehending, I'm lost. Suddenly he's aware, I'm lost. More than that, in his desperation, he comes to a place where he, where he concludes, Jesus is the one to help me. Here's a man who's raised literally in the middle of God's people. He's raised in a city that day after day after day, if he was aware of it, it was a constant reminder, Jericho, of God's provision, miraculous intervention, God exists, God is his people's salvation. He's living at a time that's filled with excitement and wonder and awe and potential. Could I suggest to you we live in a day like that right now? He was lost, he had no bearings. He was, for God's reasons, he tells us, he was a tax gatherer and he was rich, but he was unhappy and disoriented. He was adrift, he had wealth without a foundation, he had no anchor, our students. Zacchaeus, like the rest of us, was living his life as a sequence of choices, we all do. And every decision you and I make makes it more or less likely that we'll obey Christ with the next breath that we breathe. 
And he'd lived a lifetime of choices that led him further and further from Christ. Now listen, I don't know how you've been behaving during COVID-19, but you too have been in a sequence of choices, as have I. And my question this morning is, have my, have my sequence of choices led me further into intimacy with Christ or farther, farther away from him? Am I disoriented from him? It's a trajectory of our life. It's possible to be in a seminary or a Bible college and actually be making a sequence of choices that lead me further from Christ. It's possible. You know, I look at Zacchaeus and I think, does Zacchaeus sound familiar? <laughs> he could, this is so contemporary. This is so 2021 in Canada and the United States, I would, I would argue. He's all around us. Verse seven says, uh, he was a sinner and he was committed to sin. It, it, that, that, could that not be a North American world system? By the time we get to verse three, it says he wanted to see Jesus. Literally, he wanted to see Jesus, who he was. In verse five, Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus, but Jesus sees him. Zacchaeus did the only thing that he could do. He climbed a sycamore tree. Jesus did the rest. Jesus came to him, he saw him, he told him to come down, he went to his house. That was all Jesus. Jesus sees him, he seeks him. And he says, I've come to seek and to save you. It reminds me of a hymn that I, I guess countless times I sang the hymn growing up, Victory in Jesus. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming love. Jesus initiates contact with Zacchaeus. He hunts him down. Here's the thing is, is um, when I think about the story of Zacchaeus, the way I was taught the story of Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus is all about people who do not follow Jesus Christ yet. In my, it, it, the way that I, I read that story. But is it possible that I could be a seminary president? Is it possible that you could be a seminary professor, a seminary student, a college student, a college professor, and also be up a sycamore tree trying to find out what on earth Jesus is doing in, through, and around your life? I think it is possible. I believe that Jesus may well have gone to the city of Jericho for the express reason of actually encountering Zacchaeus of seeking him out, of finding him, of despising him. It's possible to be in a school like Southwestern or the Canadian Southern Baptist Seminary and College and actually be disoriented to the ways of God. It's possible to get to this place in the semester and be feeling somewhat lost. This story is for you and I too. Jesus sees you. Do, you. do you ever feel that way sometimes? We don't say it in ministry. But do you ever sometimes feel like, God, do you see me? Do you see what's happened during COVID-19? I can't please anybody. If I move this way, this side condemns me. If I move this way, this side condemns me. If I quit, I'm condemned. If I stay in it, I'm exhausted. Jesus sees you. He sees you. He seeks you out. Here's something that I didn't see before, though. In verse three, it says the reason he had to climb the sycamore tree is because there was a big crowd and he was a short man. In other words, he couldn't see Jesus because of the crowd. And at, at first I think, well, that's kind of um, neither a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a thing. The crowd's not to blame. You know, they're, just, they're just the crowd. By the time you get to verse seven, though, you realize the crowd actually had every opportunity to see Zacchaeus themselves, but they chose not to. They despised him, and by the time Jesus tells them to come out of the tree, they get indignant with Jesus, they're frustrated with Jesus, they're bothered by Jesus, they complain to Jesus, what on the earth are you doing with Zacchaeus? It caused me to wonder, you know, again, the way I read that story, the way I was told that story, the real question is, Rob, are you Zacchaeus? But one of the things that stopped me during COVID is actually, Rob, are you part of the crowd that's getting in the way of Zacchaeus and Jesus. Let me explain what I mean by this. During the midst of COVID-19, and, and, and let's just be honest, uh, if we took COVID off the table, there'd still be ample room for us to champion our causes. You know what I'm saying? A righteous cause 
is not sufficient without a righteous character. A deficient character will, by necessity, contaminate what you think is a righteous cause. It will pervert it, and the witness to Christ will be diminished. And what is the chief toxin in our pursuit of righteous causes? Lovelessness. In the absence of love, we will not seek. In the absence of love, we will not see people. Even though we're surrounded by sycamore trees with more Zacchaeuses than we can count, we'll never see them. We will assume that any and all means are open to us. They're justified toward the success of our goals, the the declaration of our opinions, the implementations of our convictions. If we're going to speak in the name of Christ, we better give ample, obvious evidence of the love of Christ. 1 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, Paul confesses that Christ's love compels us. His love compels us. If we're going to speak in the name of Christ, we better be compelled by Christ. Of all the realities that press in on us, our primary compulsion must be Jesus. That was one of the haunting questions. When I read verse three, I can excuse the crowd. When I get to verses six and seven, it becomes obvious that there is some other dynamic happening with those who are gathered around Zacchaeus, and that is they choose not to see him. That's a crowd problem. If the crowd you're running with does not see Zacchaeus up a tree, you have a problem, it's not a righteous cause. If if the crowd you're running with, I don't care what name you are, it could be Canadian Southern Baptist Seminary or whatever name you choose, if the crowd you're running with does not love people, does not see people, I question whether we can champion a righteous cause. Why? Because Jesus said he came to seek and save. Jesus came to seek and save Canadians. Jesus came to seek and save Americans. Jesus came to seek and save people throughout this world. He came to seek and save the lost. If not for for Jesus, Zacchaeus would be stuck up a tree, right? Like, he's up there looking for Jesus. If Jesus didn't intervene, if he didn't initiate something with him, he would just watch the crowd disperse beneath him, slowly go home dejected. But because of Jesus, everything in his life was changed. He's transformed. Everybody else looks past Zacchaeus. Jesus looked at him. He saw him. Verse five, he says, come down immediately. I've got to stay at your house today. It makes me wonder, have I heard Jesus say that to me? Like, is he welcome in my house today? My knee-jerk reaction is, well, of course he is. I'm a Christian, I'm a Christ follower. That doesn't mean he's, like, do I need to have a fresh Zacchaeus moment with Jesus today? Say, Jesus, you're welcome in my house. You're welcome to redistribute Whatever resources I have, whatever time I'm spending, you're welcome to have access to that. It's all yours. Is he welcome in our home? Zacchaeus is transported into the right into the middle of a God's activity. It changes everything about him. By verse 8, he's got two resolutions. He says, I'm going to give and I'm going to restore. From, from saying I can't get enough to I can't give enough. From selfish, senseless lifestyles to restorative lifestyles, you know. He repents which is reconciling to God, and he restores reconciling with people. Verse 9, Jesus transforms the very essential nature, which was for him greed, to suddenly becoming a gracious person. Again, these are just questions I'm scribbling down in these early months of COVID. Rob, when people see your life, when they encounter your life, would they describe you as a loving person? When people see your life, when they encounter your life, Would they describe you as a gracious person? When the people come into contact with your church and all the pressures that you're under, the crucible that we're living in right now, culturally, would they conclude that here are people who love God, love his word, and love his people? Would they describe us as compassionate, 
suddenly the disposition of Zacchaeus' life is not selfish anymore, it's, it's righteous. How deep is the forgiveness of God? How vast the ocean of God's love? Wave after wave after wave crashing on us. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Maybe you're here this morning and you'd say, honestly, where I'm at right now, I'm in a tree. I'm Zacchaeus. I'm disoriented. I, I don't know the way out of where I'm at. Can I just suggest to you this morning, Jesus sees you. He still saves. I, I think... Canadians are dying to see people who actually believe Jesus is who he said he is. He will do what he said he will do. And there is freedom and there is hope. Well, if you're in a tree, I would say Jesus is here this morning. Another pressing question. Surrounded by a crowd of people, do you see a tree around you somewhere? If not, that was a conviction for me. It's like, Rob, there are sycamore trees all around your life. It's not, it's, there, are, there are times in the Bible where God does a miracle, right? There, there are spiritual realities that people don't see, and suddenly their eyes are open. Zacchaeus wasn't hidden. It wasn't like there was some magical tree. Everybody saw the tree. Everybody saw Zacchaeus in the tree. Rob, are you just walking by them like everybody else, or will you stop and in the power of Christ look and proclaim he came to seek and save you? You need to know that you are sought after. You are saved. There is fresh hope every day. There's fresh love every day. And with Christ, you can seek and save. A population of people who right now in the wake of COVID are desperate for a message of hope. There is healing. There's hope. There's love. See the tree. Let me pray with you. Father, we can read about Zacchaeus, but we thank you. Every one of us in this room has been Zacchaeus. We might confess we are Zacchaeus. We need you. We are perpetually desperate for you. We open our arms to embrace the message that you came to seek and save the lost. You came to seek and save us. And you've entrusted to us the message of the love, the seeking after, the salvation that we have in Christ. Open our eyes to the trees around us. The passions that are stirred within us for a righteous cause, could it be matched to a righteous character filled with love and grace and compassion? so that we would be known as people who love you with all our hearts. Love your word. Love your people. And we'll expend every ounce of our energy to go after those in a sycamore tree because we believe Jesus came just for that seeking and saving. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we respond to the word, the preach word this morning as we sing, Cornerstone, Christ alone, Cornerstone. Weak made strong, the Savior's love. Let's sing together, my hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' love.
his oath and his covenant. His oath is covenant, his blood. So forth to be in the whelming flood. And all around my soul gives way. He is all my whole Christ. these words of benediction now from Romans chapter 15. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed.